Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back at Duelist Den. And our subject for this video is going to be Colt's 1860 Army Revolver. Now, this was the most popular sidearm among Federal forces during the American Civil War. Well, today's big challenge is keeping the lenses clear enough <laughs> to actually be able to record anything. <laughs> uh, what we call the Model 1860 Army Revolver was actually designated the New Model Army Revolver by Colt. Not to be confused with the Remington New Model Army. That's how they, they both have the same name. The 1860 is a six-shot cap and ball revolver that was manufactured between 1860 and 1873. And by cap and ball, what I mean is it is loaded through the front of the chamber with either cartridges or loose powder and ball. And then a percussion cap is placed on the nipples in the back. Cap and ball. And that's how they shot. Now, this weapon would have been carried mainly by officers, cavalrymen, artillerymen, other auxiliary units that could not carry a rifle. Uh, but of course, as the war went on, a lot of common foot soldiers, the infantrymen, used creative logistics and equipped themselves with a Colt 1860 as well. So by the time the war was over, the 1860 was spread pretty widely across the troops. So today I brought my personal 1860 revolver. This is an original. It was made in 1862 by Colt. And we're going to put it through its paces today, see how a 160-year-old gun will perform in today's world. So. We're going to get it loaded up. I'll show you that procedure, and then I think we'll go have some words with Evil Roy. Now, the Colt 1860 Army Revolver was designed to be a military weapon, so it was designed to be loaded with paper cartridges. And they would have been carried in packaging very much like this, in a cartridge box like this that would have held two reloads. So 12 shots in here, six in the gun, and that should get you through anything because this gun was not designed to be an offensive weapon for most of the people carrying it. Now for cavalry it's a little bit different, but if you're an officer, if you're an artilleryman, this was for self-defense. And 18 shots was probably all you're going to need. By then you'd have driven them off or you're dead. So that's that's how this was made and that's kind of important as we go to reload it. Well. No matter what else, Evil Roy is a good sport. Last time I was out here, he had to pretend to be a Yankee. This time he's got to be a Confederate. He never complains. But let's take the Colt 1860, load it up with our paper cartridges, and see if we can make poor old Roy dance. All right, well, as I just said, being a military gun, this Colt was designed to shoot paper cartridges, which made logistics much simpler for the Army. Now it'll still it'll shoot loose uh, loose ball and powder, you know, just like any cap and ball. But cartridges make it much more convenient. And this is a better look at one of those cartridge boxes. Two of these would have been carried in the cartridge uh, cartridge box on your belt. So you would have had two sets of reloads, and and this includes not just six cartridges, but also the caps. So everything would have been included in here. You would have pulled this wire to rip the paper and there'd be six cartridges in here. Uh, these were made by John Gurney and they're very historically accurate. So I don't want to use them up right now. Now you can get from a number of sources reproduction cartridge boxes like these. And these are pretty nice. These are made, by the way, by Cap and Ball in Europe, Balzath Nimeth, Cap and Ball Channel. And they open up and they hold, you know, six six cartridges. I get a lot of lube on mine so it'll be kind of a tight fit. But they'll get six cartridges in there. So, so you've got some uh, some options for packaging if you want to go historically correct. Now obviously what I like to do is just use this. So I just tore this paper. The way this works, pretty simple, single action. I'm going to put it on half cock. So the cylinder will rotate. I've already got one in here, so I'm gonna 
load the second one and this is one of the things that distinguishes an original 1860 army from the modern replicas is it's designed to take paper cartridges so they load right in you can't do that with an Uberti or a Pieta without modifying the gun in here which I've done uh, to both Uberti's and Pieta's and I've got several videos on the subject so um, I'll just link to them and you can see them but as you can see it's much easier I put a lot of grease on these things it's much easier to just put a uh, paper cartridge in here and load it that way right. than it is to load loose powder and balls so if you're on the battlefield and you gotta reload that's what you want to do so I'm gonna load all six and then cap it and then we'll go have a conversation with Evil Roy okay now we've loaded it up I think it's time to go do a little bit of shooting. Well, no matter what else, Evil Roy is a good sport. Last time I was out here, he had to pretend to be a Yankee. This time he's got to be a Confederate. He never complains. But let's take the Colt 1860, load it up with our paper cartridges, and see if we can make poor old Roy dance. The 1860 Army was really the firearms equivalent of finding the Holy Grail. What it did is it combined 44 caliber stopping power with the lightness and pointability of a belt pistol like the 1851 Navy. And that was something the Colt tried to achieve for quite a while and they finally did it with the 1860 Army. The Colt's first 44 caliber revolver was the classic 1847 Walker Colt. Now that gun was a behemoth in every sense of the word. It weighed over four and a half pounds empty. It had a nine inch long barrel and really it could not be carried as a belt pistol. I mean you could but you'd feel yourself sinking into the earth with each step. I mean that had to be carried uh, on a horse with saddle holsters. But it revolutionized warfare, uh, so you got to give it props. But Colt quickly downsized the Walker into the Dragoon series. It cut the barrel down to seven and a half inches. It shortened up the chamber, so instead of a 60 grain charge of powder, it fired a 40 grain charge of powder. It made the gun overall handier, but it still weighed over four pounds. This was still a big gun. Uh, make no mistake. And it really was too big for practical holster carry. You had to, had to carry it on a horse. So, because of that, Colt's 1851 Navy revolver, which was a true belt pistol, became the most popular gun, full-size gun in Colt's inventory. The most popular gun was actually the model 1849 uh, pocket model. And... That's no surprise. It's the same as small guns today. But for full-size guns, the 1851 Colt Navy was far and away the most popular gun. And Colt and his engineers tried for a decade to shrink the Dragoon model down to the size of a Navy. And they had you know, some experimental successes, but by and large, it just was not working out. So they took another tact. And what they did, instead of trying to shrink a Dragoon down, is they decided to pump a Navy up. And that ended up being the key. So the Colt 1860 Army basically starts off with an, a Colt 1851 Navy frame. It's the exact same frame. 
with one difference. Because to make the 1860 Army accommodate 44 caliber projectiles, what they did is they took the 1851 cylinder and they expanded the forward two-thirds of it, increased the diameter of it. But they kept the last third the same size. Then they cut a step in the frame to accommodate the bigger diameter front end. But all of the action parts are in the back of the frame. So what that allowed Colt to do was use the exact same action and parts, no change at all, on the 1860 Army as they used on the 1851 Navy. And they made the cylinder slightly longer, and they fit that in by cutting off a bit of the forcing cone of the barrel, so the barrel is shorter on the back end. And Colt credits improvements in steel, though this is probably not the case. Uh, because fluted models of this gun, fully fluted models, did blow up. Uh, which is why they went to the solid cylinder, like the Navy, with the roll engraved uh, scene on it, just like the Navy. But, by and large, that did the trick. So, now, by making that one cut in the frame, and by expanding the front of the cylinder, they went from a 36 to a 44. And, of course, the 44 caliber barrel... Uh, but the barrel was another innovation of Colt's. It wasn't the octagon barrel that you had on the Colt Navy. It was an 8-inch, instead of 7.5-inch, but it was an 8-inch streamlined round barrel. Anyway, Colt went to a streamlined round barrel. It looked great. Colt went to a streamlined round barrel on the 1860 Army. It looked great, and it had the advantage of being easier to manufacture than the octagon barrel. They also got rid of the hinged loading lever on the 1851, and they went with a rack and pinion design that they called the creeping loading lever. And what this did is it took all the stress off that hinge and instead transferred it to that rack and pinion system that is much stronger and smoother. So that was actually a big improvement, for being able to seat the balls and the cartridges more easily with less perceived force. And then the final change they made was to increase the size of the grip so that you could better control that 44 caliber firepower. Now, whether or not that was necessary, and I would contend it isn't because they went back to the Navy grip for the Colt Single Action Army, whether or not it's necessary, the Army grip actually works phenomenally well. It's incredibly comfortable. It, it points intuitively. It was a great design, and sometimes I wonder why they abandoned it in favor of the Navy grip for the Colt Single Action Army. Uh, either grip would have been just fine on there. When that was done, you had this. Right? The pinnacle of cap and ball revolver design, many would say, including me, in the 19th century. Colt's 1860 New Model Army, as they termed it. I don't know if I caught it on video, but I just had a turkey call uh, just over there in the den, which is always a cool thing. So, at the beginning of this video, I told you that this gun was the most popular sidearm in Union forces. And I know a lot of you are going to say, well, what about the Remington? The Remington's a better gun. It has a solid top strap. You can change the cylinders out for faster reloads, which, by the way, I found no evidence of anybody ever doing that in the 19th century, but you can. Uh, and I don't mean to downplay the Remington, I like them. I've got like four Remingtons myself, so yeah, I'm really not, not complaining. But uh, when I say that the Colt was the most popular sidearm, it was. And let's take a look at the numbers, the tail of the tape. Overall, from 1860 to 1873, Colt manufactured over 200,000 Model 1860 armies. During the Civil War alone, Colt manufactured 156,000 
1860 armies. Of those, 129,000 plus were made specifically for Union military forces. In comparison, the Remington 44 caliber army in all of its configuration produced just over 116,000 for Union forces. Now, that sounds fairly close, but you got to consider one thing. 4 February 1864, the Colt plant had a major fire, and that fire put it out of operation for the balance of the war. So the last Colt 1860 delivered to the Union military was delivered on November 10th, 1863. So basically, for the last year and a half of the war, Colt could not fill its contracts. And that was greatly to Remington's benefit. As a matter of fact, Remington ended up, to pick up the slack, because the government went to Remington, to pick up the slack, Remington ended up producing 24-7, and they could not meet the production goals that the government set for them. So... Basically, the reason Remington is so high, or as close to Colt as they are, is because of the Colt fire. Now, that's not a value judgment as to whether or not the Remington is a stronger frame or any of that stuff. I'm just telling you that during the war, Colts were the preferred sidearm of the Union forces. All right, enough history talk. Let's go do a little more shooting. Well, let's finish up by putting the old war horse to work here on Swing City. Got him. All right, you probably noticed my loading lever dropping on some of these shots. Well, the first uh, couple of cylinders I, I shot, I was using Go-X powder. It was uh, cartridges I had loaded a while ago. And then I ran out of those, and I switched over to more recent cartridges loaded with Swiss. And that's just how much hotter that Swiss is. It's just banging that loading lever down. So... I don't know, a little rough on this old gun, so I'll probably shoot lighter loads in this from now on. But uh, that's about the equivalent of what I would have been shooting 160 years ago as far as power goes. I certainly would not want to get hit with one of those big conicals powered by that Swiss powder. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at the 1860 Army, shot with paper cartridges the way it would have been back in the day. And uh, if you enjoyed it, you know what to do, right? Thumbs up. Trick that algorithm. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe and go check out MikeBellevue.com. There's lots of great black powder content out there. And until I see you again, bye.